Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Arias, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. I'm going to continue to ask you the questions submitted by the jury. Several times while testifying about the abuse by Travis, you have made comments like, as I understand it now, and I've come to realize. How has this realization come about? In, because about almost five years have passed, um, just the farther away I get from the situation, the more perspective I have, whereas before I constantly made excuses for him. Um, now I understand that the things that occurred were not okay. Um, and, you know, forgiving him is different from continually putting up with it. So, in hindsight, the farther away I get from the situation, the more perspective I have of those events and the abuse. Were individuals involved in helping you come to these realizations? Um, sometimes spiritual um, leaders, things like that. Um, it's mostly just reflection on the incidents. Tell us who they are and what their professions may be. Um, these were um, individuals with the church. I don't know what their professions are. So, but they come to the um, come to where I live, and they they counsel me spiritually, things like that. Um, mostly, most of them are from the Mormon Church. Um, there's also a lady from the Baptist Church who continues to visit me regularly. You are recalling times of memory loss with Travis. How is it possible you remember such details from those days if you had a foggy memory? I'm sorry. Can you reread that, please? You were recalling times of memory loss with Travis. How is it possible you remember such details from those days if you had a foggy memory? The fog or the confusion only begins when he starts screaming or if there's um, a fear that maybe there's going to be tension or some kind of escalation of anger or violence. Um, and then certain incidents such as the physical pain is crystallized in my mind. Um, so that sticks, and then also there are journal entries that I've made that remind me of that day and details of that day. So it helps me remember, oh yeah, that day I did this before I went to Travis's house. I remember it was around this time, or this day or this day of the week. So I did review my journals constantly um, over the years, and that's given me perspective as far as, you know, things like that. So the confusion comes in when he begins to get angry. Is there anyone else who knows about your memory issues? Um, well, I mean, again, I think I have a really excellent memory. Just the issue. Answer the question as stated. Oh, it's hard because I don't think I have memory issues. All right, then that's your answer. Did Travis's roommates ever hear these altercations, to your knowledge? I'm not sure about that. To your knowledge, did anyone else hear your altercations? Yes, they have. Um, that would be Dan Freeman heard the last tail end of the altercation the morning we went to have soup pie. He came into the bedroom as Travis was storming out of the bedroom. Um, so there was that, and then also in the car, um, we had pulled over, and it was actually so I could use the bathroom. Um, in the forest rather than take pictures. But um, that led to an argument. When I came back to the car, he had locked me out. <clears throat> Travis locked me out, so he saw that. I just went and sat by the side of the road and waited for him to open the door, and he lost patience, and he came out of the car, and I came back in. But it led to an argument over that. Um, so Dan and Desiree were witness to that. Um, I don't know if they saw any other arguments. and. I don't think anyone else, that, to my knowledge, would have seen any. You have testified about several incidents where Travis was physical to you. Were you ever physical to Travis besides when you killed him? I think when he was choking me, my hands were free. He was over my torso. My arms were free. So I may have tried to push him off or 
I didn't want to injure him. I just wanted him to get off of me. But that was very quick, and it didn't last long. Would you consider the event when Travis choked you a stressful event? Certainly, yes. If yes, why do you recall the event so clearly? I recall up to the point where he was choking me and passing out. Um, I had disorientation after I woke up. Um, I had to get my bearings. I wasn't sure where I was. Um, then I recognized Travis's bedroom. I was laying on my side coughing, and so I saw the Judge carpet. Your response as to how, she how she's able to relate it today. She's explaining it, Your Honor. Overall, you may continue. Um, so I was experiencing disorientation. I wasn't thinking, gosh, Travis just choked me out. I was actually a thought sort of wandered through my mind. I said, where's Napoleon in my head? That was my thought. So it didn't really have any relation to the event. That was just a thought. I was kind of getting my bearings. Um, so there is, it's not completely clear. I just remember he had his hands around my neck and he was banging my head on the carpet. And I tried to push him off and it was, then I, I blacked out really shortly after that. In the moments of stress or fog, how do you recall what happened in those moments if it affects your memory? I don't recall clearly what happens in those moments um, as far as details, every detail. I just, sometimes I have a general sense of what's going on and sometimes I don't. But as far as the fog goes, it's more, again, just words that are being spoken or screamed or yelled and that sort, processing that sort of thing. Um, physical things I can remember because I, I feel them physically. Um, I can remember what I feel internally and emotionally as well, but it's more the, the words that are being spoken and their meanings, but it's, I do remember what I feel, if that makes sense. Why were you afraid of the consequences if you killed Travis in self-defense? I was, I believed that it's not okay in any circumstance to take someone's life even if you're defending your own life. That's how I believed it. So I never really stopped to consider how society would view it. If someone is defending themselves, I just felt like I had done something wrong and I was afraid of what the consequences would be. What happened to the gas cans after the road trip in June of 2008? They went back to my grandmother's house um, where I went back to eventually, and um, I was taking a road trip to Monterey and had intended to bring them to Daryl, but I never made it to that road trip. Regarding shaking memory foggy reaction, number one, if you, do you always have a reaction as you described when someone corrects or challenges you? <coughs> I do now. I've gotten a little bit better and a little bit stronger. It's a condition that started again in November 2007 and continued. It continues to this day, but I've gotten a little better about it. Number two, is this the same reaction you have when someone yells or raises their voice at you? Yes, for the most part. Sometimes someone might yell and it, it's done and over with, and it doesn't make me shake, but um, the majority of the time it does. Number three, have you ever had any situations where you have raised your voice? Yes, um, probably a million times. <coughs> You mentioned the pain of sex is one of the reasons you brought KY into the relationship. What are the other reasons? Um, well, for example, on direct, I just I think I mentioned that it um, it facilitates our activities a little bit better. Um, it makes them more enjoyable and, of course, less painful. During these altercations, why didn't you just scream in hopes that someone would hear you and help you? I did scream. I wasn't thinking of somebody helping me. Um, 
For example, I screamed when he threw me on the floor and started kicking me. Um, I was unable to scream when he had his hands around my windpipes. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I was screaming on June 4th. I'm handing you Exhibit 164. What was the date and time stamped on Exhibit 164? 1.42 and 53 seconds p.m. And the date? I'm sorry, it was 6.408. If you were scared of what Travis was capable of doing, why would you ever let him tie you up? When that occurred, he was um, in a very good mood and he wasn't displaying any signs of agitation. Um, and that was the Travis that I liked and was not afraid of. Um, the moment he began to get angry, my warning bells started to go off and I began to be, get cautious, for lack of a better term. But he hadn't displayed any of that. We just woke up, we were getting along. So, and again, they were, um, they were loose enough to wiggle out of. So I wasn't like stuck there at his mercy, so to speak. Was Travis tied up at any point on June 4, 2008? No. Do you recall the injuries on Travis's body at any point during June 4 without the aid of photographs? No, I didn't even realize that I shot him. You mentioned that one of the reasons you chose not to write negative things in your journal was because you were concerned that Travis would read it. Is that correct? That's correct. After October, I didn't write anything else negative. Um, he found it. Um, this would be late October, early November, and said that's not in line with the secret, the secret being the law of attraction. And um, made me tear it out. So at that point, I was into the law of attraction. I agreed with him. I figured he's right. And honestly, I felt really bad because that's the first time he'd ever heard me say something, write something negative about him. I'd never said negative things toward him or about him. Um, I always edified him positively, positively behind his back. And um, he, I felt like, kind of like I'd been caught saying something very bad about him. So I didn't do that anymore. If that is the case, why were you okay with leaving an entry in your journal that talked about how Travis would get angry if he knew you had gone to Rachel's house? That would have been in late August or early September that I wrote that, and this argument that occurred would be late October, and the subsequent um, lecturing of writing negative things occurred after that, maybe later in October, late, late, or early November. Why was it okay to write about how Travis made you both sick and happy, or sad and miserable, or that something wasn't right about him? That was a very mild way of, of how I sometimes felt about that darker side of him, um, as far as sick or miserable. Um, as far as just the emotional turmoil and the um, pedophilia. And so that was also a side of him that, again, he was trying to overcome and eradicate. So at the same time, he had beautiful sides to him. So what I was doing in that is I was listing the contrast of the range of emotions that I felt when I was with him. After you snatched the gun off the shelf, did you do anything to the gun, such as cock it, slip off the safety, manipulate a slide, or anything prior to it going off? I don't even think I would know how to do that, so the answer is I don't know. Probably not. I just grabbed it and pointed it, is what I remember. Had you ever had any firearms training or fired a 25 caliber pistol prior to this event? Um, never fired a gun, but I was relatively familiar with them, not formally trained, but relatively familiar, just, I don't know, not formally trained. How far away from you was Travis when the gun went off? Not when he lunged, but when the gun went off. The lunging and the gun going off was sort of contemporaneous. I don't remember how close they were or if they happened exactly at the same moment. 
or one right after the other. It all happened very fast, and it all seemed to happen all at once. And I would say as far as distance, maybe as far as Mr. Babicki is, but I couldn't say for sure, for absolute certain certainty. You stated that you remember throwing the gun into the desert, but do you remember what happened to the box it was in? No, I do not. What about the holster you mentioned? I only saw the holster before I moved. I didn't see it again after that. Did he keep extra ammunition with the gun? I never saw ammunition next to the gun, and I never found any in the house when I was cleaning. If Travis lunged at you, why didn't you just move to the side out of his way? Well, I, it happened very fast. I didn't have time to think. Um, everything just happened, it seemed, in a split second. So mm -hmm. I really don't, I just didn't have time to think, move this way or that way or back up or do this or that. It just happened the way it happened without really thinking about the best move to make. You remember dropping the knife and screaming, but you don't remember taking the gun or rope with you. Is that correct? In a sense, that's correct. I remember that, uh, dropping the knife and screaming, and, and that memory came much later. It, actually the I'm Question. sorry. No. Can Overruled. I start? Overruled. Okay. May continue. Um, but it goes blank after that. I don't remember putting the gun in the car. I don't remember putting the rope in the car. But I have not crystal clear, but pretty, pretty solid memories of disposing of those things. So they w did go in the car, obviously, but I don't remember placing them in the car. You are stating you believe you stabbed Travis based on logic. How do you explain the blood on your hands and clothes and the bloody palm print on the wall? Well, I do know that we struggled that day. And I mean, based on logic, it would have been because of how we fought. I don't know how things ended up, where they ended up. I just know that we were fighting physically. If you were kneeling when you dropped the camera, how did it roll as far as it did? It didn't really roll very far. It just kind of gave a bounce or two and maybe rolled like right here. It didn't roll very far. Was Travis sitting down when you dropped the camera? Yes, he was. I think so. How did Travis's anger escalate after you shot him? He, I don't remember the words he was saying, but he was angrier, he was screaming more, he was cursing more, um, and we had fallen over right after that shot occurred, and he was grabbing at my clothes and grabbing at me, and again, as soon as I broke away, he threatened my life, so that was definitely an escalation in his anger, that's how I interpreted it. Was he chasing you after you shot him in the head? Right after the shot occurred, um, we had fallen over um, in the bathroom, again toward the sink, bath, um, the sink and garbage can area, kind of in the corner. So he didn't chase me in that moment, but that's where we struggled on the floor. And again, as soon as I broke away and he said, effing kill you, bitch. Um, I don't remember a lot after that, so whether he chased me or not, I couldn't say. When you purchased gas at the Arco in Pasadena, why didn't you just fill everything up at the pump so that it was all under one transaction? Why do three separate transactions? Well, what I do recall is when I filled the gas cans, rather than have just a loose gas hose somewhere, I didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, so I hung it up, and when I hung it up, that, that ends the transaction. So that's probably why, if I could have 
you know, put them back in the trunk or wherever, and then started the car or vice versa. Um, at one point, I didn't want to just set it on the ground, so I hung it up. I know that ended the transaction. Um, so that's probably why there was more than one, and maybe I was topping off the gas tank for another. During your testimony about the abuse by Travis, you have made several comments like, as I understand it now, or I've come to realize when discussing events that you may not have classified as abuse then, but see it as such now. Have you utilized professional help? I have not had access to professional help. No, I haven't utilized that. Did you enjoy having sex with Travis? For the most part, yes, I did, very much. Did he force you to do things you didn't want to do? There were things I was uncomfortable with. Um, I didn't feel altogether forced. Um, I went along with it. So I didn't, he didn't physically force me or anything like that. Why did you wait for so long to tell the truth? Again, it took, it took a long time. Um, it took a long time for me to get to this point. I never wanted to admit to this. And I had written out all my suicide letters. I sent my note, I sent them all in an envelope to my grandmother's, do not open until November 10th, 2008. I was hoping to be dead by then. I was like giving myself a little time to get my affairs in order. That date rolled by and then more time rolled by and I was, I was still here. So with the evolution, of just time and the years, a couple of years that went by, it was a gradual process and I began to feel not right about keeping it in instead. How many times did you try to kill yourself? I believe that was in California when I took apart my razor um, and was going to do that. That was the only serious attempt I've made. Other than that, it's just like ideation, thinking how I might be able to do this or that, things like that. Would you decide to tell the truth if you never got arrested? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. You said that one of your worst fears was for everyone to find out what was going on in your relationship. So why did you talk to 48 Hours and other TV stations? My attempt to talk to them was to present a better image of our relationship and downplay the negative aspects as not really a big deal, it wasn't that bad, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I knew that he did that, but that wasn't a big deal. Um, even our arguments. Oh, sure, it was, there was turmoil, there were, it was rocky, but we were friends. So my attempt was more to present a, a good image of Travis and a good image of myself and that our relationship had its ups and downs, but we were still um, on good terms. You stated in the interview with Detective Flores that Travis liked to shave the old-fashioned way. This would normally include use of a traditional straight razor. Did Travis own or use a straight razor? I don't think he did. When I said traditional way, I'm not overly familiar with the process of how men shave their faces. I just know that he really got into it. So I think he used something that would be like a Bic, actually. Like a what? A Bic, Bic razor. In testimony on March 5, 2013, you mentioned filling a third gas can. When and where did you get this can? Can you reread that? I'm sorry. In testimony on March 5, 2013, you mentioned filling a third gas can. When and where did you get this can? March 5? I believe that was, um, that was a hypothetical. I didn't get, I had a third can when I originally purchased one in Salinas. I returned it before leaving Salinas. Um, so what we were doing is throwing out a hypothetical as to why would I only put two gallons in a third tank, or third can. So that was a hypothetical. I only had two gas cans with me. Why didn't you just run out of the house instead of grabbing the gun from the closet? Well, again, I can't 
it happened so fast. Um, I did initially think run, so that's why I went down the hallway. And then right as I got to the hallway with the doors being shut, it just seemed like more of an obstacle. It would give him more time to catch up to open the door this way and run around it and out when this door was an equal distance and open and I could just run that way and into it. So my thought maybe initially was to run out the other door and then around and out, but just something to create more distance because last time I'd run that same route, I was not successful in running out of the room. You said when the gun went off, you weren't sure if you shot Travis. So when you came out of the fog on your way to Utah, why didn't you call 911 to help Travis? When I sort of came out of the fog, I realized, oh crap, something bad had happened. And I was scared to call any authority at that point. All right, council, please approach. There are some additional questions from the jury.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you go back to the jury room for approximately five minutes, and then we will bring you back. Please remember the admonition. Yes, the record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Ms. Arias, you may step down and counsel, you may approach. I think that's about as much.
Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Why would you hypothesize about filling a third gas can? I was just answering the question I was asked. So I don't know why there was a hypothesis there. You stated today that you did not have professional help when dealing with your issues. Yet yesterday, you mentioned talking to a psychiatrist to deal with Travis's possible child porn issues. Can you explain? Can you read that last part again? Or you can read the whole thing if you want. You stated today that you did not have professional help when dealing with your issues. Yet yesterday, you mentioned talking to a psychiatrist to deal with Travis's possible child porn issues. Can you explain? Yes. Um, it was actually, I believe, a psychologist. And it wasn't to deal with the issues. That wasn't for professional help. That was for an evaluation of me, not counseling of any kind. You say you waited two years to tell the truth because you were ashamed. Does that mean you are no longer ashamed? No, that doesn't. I'm still very deeply ashamed. It simply means that it became more difficult to deal with holding it in. Because like I said, the feeling of being fraudulent is, was so great, I couldn't hold it in any longer. Did you look into the possibility of renting a GPS system along with a rental car? I believe it was offered. They're, they're typically offered when I've rented cars in the past. Um, but it costs more, and I was trying to save money. So no, I, I didn't. In the story of a man and woman attacking Travis, you mentioned talking to him also mentioned was Travis being on all fours. Do you in fact recall him doing any of those things? I do recall him screaming and yelling at me. Um, so I don't know if that constitutes his talking, but he was saying words. Um, the other things, I don't recall as far as being on all fours, I don't. You claim that everything happened so fast and you didn't have time to think. So how could you think of grabbing the gun from the closet? What I should have said is I didn't really have time to reflect on what I should do or what I shouldn't do or what would the consequence be if I did this, X, Y, or Z. So everything happened really fast and I didn't give, give it any forethought. I just reacted and did that very quickly. How can you say that you don't have memory issues when you can't remember how you stabbed him so many times and slashed his throat? Well, I, I think that I have a good memory, and June 4th is an anomaly for me. Um, it's like I said yesterday, it's in a class of its own, and I can't explain why, what kind of state of mind I was in. Um, it was. Uh, the most of the day was an entire blank, and little pieces have come back, but not very many. So I can't explain that day alone, but if you were to put that day over here, all the other days of my life, I don't think I have memory issues that are any different from another average person. Did Mr. Martinez cause you to shake during his questioning? Yes. If so, can you please provide an estimate of how many times this happened during the current trial? During the current trial, it happened, it happened on the day of opening statements. Um, I remember that. It happened almost every day. It was most intense uh, on the first day of cross. After all the lies you have told, why should we believe you now? Lying is, isn't typically something I just do. I'm not going to say that I've never told a lie in my life before this incident, but the lies that I've told in this case are, can be tied directly back to either protecting Travis's reputation or 
my involvement in his death in any way because I was very ashamed of the death and also I wanted to edify Travis in a good way. I didn't want to de-edify him or say hateful things about him, especially now that he had passed away. And I also didn't want that to be construed as motive, for example, if he was violent with me. What happened to the suicide letters you wrote to your grandmother? I mailed them to my grandmother and I asked her to hold them. How could you kiss another man when you knew what you just did to Travis? Again, my state of mind wasn't right at that time. This was just hours afterward. And one of the reasons I went to Utah is because it was expected of me. And I thought by not showing up, it would look even more suspicious. And when I got there, Ryan and I had talked extensively about things we might do when we get there, including being romantic. Um, not sexual, but romantic. Things we would maybe dinner, hikes, things like that. Um, part of me felt that that was expected of me. If I went there and just showed up as a total ice queen and didn't want to touch him or have anything to do with him, he might think that's strange. And par so part of that was an attempt to appear normal. Um, also, when I was with Ryan, I felt a sense of safety. He wasn't pressuring me for sex, and I didn't think he was going to haul off and smack me if I said the wrong thing or did something that displeased him. Um, but again, even with all of those things, I wasn't in my right state of mind during that time. Were you in the fog when you were kissing Ryan? Yes. Would you agree that you came away from the June 4 incident rather unscathed? While Travis suffered a gunshot and multiple stab wounds, you only had a bump on your head, a bruise on your head, cuts or scrapes on your ankles, and a possible shoulder injury. As far as um, making comparison of physical injuries, him versus mine, yes, I would have to say that's a, a relatively accurate assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any other questions from the jury at this time? Mr. Nermi, you may follow up. Ms. Arias, yesterday you were asked about receiving the Book of Mormon from Travis. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were explaining to us uh, how you read a chapter a day of that book, or basically a chapter a day after you received it. Do you recall telling us that? Yes. Okay. And there were some other questions about, or answers, I guess, that brought up the uh, visits from the missionaries that came over to your house in Palm Desert. Do you recall those questions? Yes. Okay. What, the basis of some of these questions really related to um, the law of chastity. Do you recall that? That's correct. Okay. Now, one of the things that you talked about in answering these questions as it relates to the Book of Mormon does that contain a sort of list of, as it relates to premarital sex, of activities that are okay and activities that are not okay? Not in the Book of Mormon. It's, oh, it's broad. It's not, it's not listed out in detail in the Book of Mormon. For example, the Book of Mormon doesn't say oral sex is okay or not okay. It doesn't spell that out for you. No, it does not. You mentioned the missionaries being uh, younger men that came to your house. Younger men, correct? That's correct. Okay. And this kind of um, do's and don'ts list, we'll call it, uh, that wasn't in the Book of Mormon, did they give you anything of that nature? 
No, I had pamphlets, but they didn't have, as far as the law of chastity goes, that was not broken down. No. Okay. What they explained to you from your answers, it seems to be that you weren't to engage in premarital sex. Your takeaway of that was penile vaginal intercourse. Is that accurate? Well, I considered other forms of sex sex, but after gaining a sort of clarification from Travis and how he explained it, then I came to understand that vaginal sex was the ultimate like place to not go until marriage. And in terms of going to this place, uh, meaning penile vaginal intercourse, um, after these missionaries started coming over, uh, had you, were you still engaging in sex with Daryl Brewer after they came over and started telling you these things? No. And part of what we heard in your questioning is that uh, Travis, <coughs> served to provide you with uh, elaboration, if you will, on the law of chastity. Is that true? Yeah, he delineated it more for me. So that kind of list of using oral sex as a continued example, this oral sex is okay or not okay, he kind of provided that checklist for you, right? Yes. Okay. And based on his teachings, if you will, you came away from that with the idea that the law of chastity only restricted penile vaginal intercourse. During After Travis taught you these things, what was your understanding of what the law of chastity prohibited? The law of chastity prohibited vaginal intercourse between a man and a woman. Um, and that it should be saved for marriage. That was the black and white of the issue on that. Okay. Now we heard as you answer these questions and throughout your testimony of, a, of another guiding principle in your life uh, being the law of attraction. You were asked a few questions about that. Do you remember that? Yes. And one of the things that came up while you were describing the law of attraction, I want to make sure it's clear, you also started talking about something called the secret. So is the secret part of the law of attraction, or can you, could you just kind of explain that for all of us? The secret is a documentary film that came out in 2006 explaining the law of attraction. So they're synonymous. And there was another movie version that came out in 2007. Also the secret, just a few different, a different speaker. Um, but it's the same along this, it's exactly the same thing. It's the law of attraction. So the secret, was that something that you and Travis, uh, this movie, documentary as you call it, is that something you and Travis uh, watched together or tried to fall, adhere to together? Yes, he introduced me to the movie. Okay. He introduced you to the movie, but the law of attraction was something that you were familiar with before you met Travis. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, about your breakups with your boyfriends, and I kind of want to go back through that a little bit, okay? Okay. You began with Bobby Juarez dating, if you will, what have you, around age 15, correct? That's correct, the first time. What's that? The first time, yes, okay. I was 15. And you mentioned when you were ans answering the questions posed to you yesterday that you broke up with him of, and got back together a few times uh, over the years. Could you kind of explain that to us? Yes. Um, starting at age 15, I broke up with him because I felt the relationship was getting too serious. Um, I didn't talk to him for a few more years. And then when I had called him, and he wasn't responsive, I let that go. And then he called me back and we struck up a conversation and a friendship again. And then some months later, that blossomed into a romantic relationship and I began to fall in love with him. And he's who I would consider my first real true love. 
And um, then when the other girl came into the picture, um, I broke up with him. We got back together. Um, she actually came in and out of the picture a few times. Um, she came from Louisiana, so I broke up with him. Um, there were many things that caused us to break up. Sometimes he would get on his feet and have friends that would help him out, and he didn't want anything to do with me. And then other times, um, it had to do with that girl or, or just some little things. But it seemed that we were always getting back together. And then finally, <clears throat> we separated. And then two weeks went by where we didn't talk. And I felt like that was sufficient time. Um, whereas in Costa Rica, when I'd gone there, it was eight days. I felt that was sufficient time, but he came back into my job. And we started talking again. And we got into the same pattern again. And then some months later, um, I didn't see or hear from him for two weeks, and then I received an email from him. And um, I called it. He left a phone number in the email. I went to a pay phone, so he didn't have my phone number, and called it, and we spoke for a little while. And it wasn't a heated conversation, but we eventually just said some things that we needed to say and hung up, and that was the end of it. Okay. And this conversation you just uh, spoke of, um, when you were in the, in the phone booth, um, how old were you then when you finally ended things with Mr. Juarez? I was 20. And I'm sorry, I was 19, I was almost 20. Okay. Then this, you, you spoke yesterday about this uh, occasion when you uh, were giving him, you, you gave him groceries uh, after you broke up on one occasion, correct? Yes. Okay. Was that, was that after this last phone call, or was this before this last phone call? It was before. I don't remember exactly what time period or even what time of the year. Um, but it was during one of the several breakups that we had, or after that. And after this uh, phone conversation, when you were about 19 in this phone booth, there were no more attempts to contact. You didn't make any more attempts to contact him. Is that what you're telling us? That's correct. OK. Now, uh, you were asked also about uh, Victor Arias yesterday. Do you recall that? Yes. OK. And for a little bit of clarification, uh, and based on what you told us, it sounds like Victor was a gentleman that you became involved with um, sometime when you were in, the, in an off period with Mr. Juarez. Is that accurate? It was during a period where I never thought I'd see or hear from Bobby again or even contact him. Yes. Okay. You were asked about a, a trip you made uh, to spend time with his, uh, Victor's family in Costa Rica. Do you recall that question? Yes. Okay. Maybe if, you, if we step back a little bit, what were the circumstances? You met Victor in Costa Rica, right? Yes, I flew to Costa Rica when I was 16. And he and his mother and father and two sisters and his other brother were at the airport to meet me and pick me up. OK, and how did, that, how did that come about, that you just go to Costa Rica and spend time with this family? This was right after my sophomore year. And in September, the beginning of my sophomore year, there was some flyers put up, and it was announced. and it just sounded so exciting to me. So I went home and told my parents, I'm going to Costa Rica. And they just looked at me like I was crazy. But what I did is I worked at my dad's restaurant and saved up all the money I could um, for the trip. And I think my parents threw a little money toward the trip for me as well. And I was very shocked that they were OK with it and that, the, that they let me go. But that's how it came about. OK. So uh, is it uh, accurate then to surmise that this was some sort of uh, exchange program with host families? Yes, it wasn't a long-term exchange, but it was considered an exchange. Um, they have a, a, some kind of rotating semester system, so they go to school in the summer as well. And I went to school with them during the day and did things, extracurricular activities on the weekends. So you met Victor when you met this entire, uh, the entire area, Costa Rican Arias family, right? Yes. Okay. And then so when you went to visit we, we talked about, the, I guess, the continued contact with Victor, the correspondence. Was there still then a, a friendship with his, his family? 
yes, we emailed on occasion. Just his um, brother and sister, not all the family members had emails. But, and Victor would um, email my mom. They would email back and forth. And so we're clear was going back to Costa Rica to clear your head, as you told us about uh, many days ago, was that a matter of trying to rekindle things with Victor, or was this just, it was, that, was that on the agenda, I guess? No, I, hadn't, I was not interested in rekindling anything with Victor. I was interested in maintaining a friendship, but not a romantic relationship. As it relates to the overall question of your breakups throughout your life, uh, you were the you also had a breakup with uh, Matt McCartney, right? Yes. Okay. And we heard about uh, the uh, conversation you had with Bianca and how he was uh, unfaithful to you. You learned that through that conversation. Do you recall telling us about that? Yes. Okay. That breakup then, you had a conversation with Mr. McCartney after you spoke with Bianca. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Tell us again how that conversation took place and if, if you could, the, just the kind of content of the conversation. Um, I went to his father's house when he returned from Brego Springs and... Um, when, I sh when I arrived, he was on the phone with Bianca, so he understood what I was there for. Um, so we decided to leave the duplex where his father was living in so that he wasn't privy to our business. And we, just, we went into my car, which was parked on the street, and just sat in there and had a conversation regarding that. Um, we were both crying. We hugged. We were sad that it was over, but we knew it was over. And it was, it was sad, actually, but it wasn't volatile or anything like that. It wasn't volatile, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. As far as after that conversation when you broke up, uh, did you uh, disconnect yourself from Mr. McCartney for a while? Did you still converse right away? Just kind of describe for us the period after that breakup. Um, well, a day or two after the breakup, I sent him an email. It was a really long email. Just one of the ways I, I processed things then was by writing everything down um, or emailing it. So I, I sent him that email, kind of like a goodbye email, just letting him know in hindsight and retrospect, this is how I feel about our relationship and how it ultimately ended up. Um, and then beyond that, I think I spoke with him one time on the phone, but we went for about a month without talking. Okay, so you go for a month without talking after you send this email, then, then you strike up a friendship. Is that, or a friendship built? Maybe just describe that for us. I don't recall exactly how we um, even rekindled our friendship. Um, I do know that he was looking for seasonal work, and when he found out I was going to be staying in a campground, he's like, oh no, he didn't like that idea. So he came with me, not really, not as an intention to try to get back together with me or vice versa, but to gain employment, also make sure that I was safe. I think that that was my impression, but he really was looking for work as well. You mentioned, and it was, it was questioned uh, of you yesterday, this idea that eventually this man who you'd been involved with sexually, you got to a point where you viewed him more as a brother. Is there a way for you to put into words how you got to that point? Um, I think with time progressing and the separation, um, it would have been spring, I think 2002, because it was the following spring that I was hired. And I remember Matt and I broke up around September 11, 2001. So it was that following spring that Ventana closed. Um, the restaurant closed. And so when the restaurant closed, Matt's income went away. And so he moved to Vail, Colorado for other seasonal work. And I stayed there and um, did little odds and ends things to continue earning a little bit of money. And he stayed in Vail for a while. And when I think the season was up there, he came back to Ventana. 
and was rehired because he had been a good employee. And um, with that space, um, we, I think we just, he had, a, I think he had a trailer and I went over there just to visit him briefly and we kind of just laughed and joked a little and he thought my blonde hair was weird because I didn't have blonde hair before he left and then I did. So, um, yeah, I just, we just kind of were comfortable with each other, but we were no longer intimate or physical. We don't even really hug often, or we didn't. And so we were just, we just kind of had a, a level of understanding that it feels like another life, to be honest, having dated him. It, that was then, and we're different now, and we respect the fact that we each have a past, and that past is in the past, and we're able to maintain a friendship. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 125. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice lunch. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Ms. Arias, you may step down. Counsel, before you leave, could I see you at the bench for just a moment?
Ms. Arias, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermi, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Arias, before we broke for lunch, we were discussing uh, your breakups or, or the history thereof that you were asked about um, yesterday. Uh, we just finished with Mr. McCartney, so I want to move now to your uh, breakup with Mr. Brewer in uh, 2006. Uh, okay? Okay. In that regard, you had said previously that, I'm probably paraphrasing here, but the relationship kind of was fizzling out or, or coming to an end to some degree. Is yes, that? in 2006, okay. yes. Okay. And was that period where, at least in your mind, it began coming to an end, was that before or after you met Travis Alexander? Um, that was, it was starting to fizzle a little bit before. Um, I'd say the summer of 2006 was a big wake-up call for where I was going in my life. And Daryl and I weren't progressing in our relationship. Okay. So, but you, as you've told us before, you didn't actually end the relationship with Mr. Brewer until after you went to the prepaid legal convention in Las Vegas. Is that correct? That's correct. I was still officially in the relationship, committed to him. Yes. Officially? What was the last part of that sentence? Committed to him. Committed to him. Yes. Okay. And that is why, as you've told us previously, you didn't kiss Mr. Alexander or anything during that conference, correct? Thanks for meeting. Was this the reason why you didn't have contact with Mr. Alexander? Yes, prior to breaking up with Daryl, I didn't have any kind of inappropriate contact with Travis. And any kind of contact, based on what you've told us in terms of your view of fidelity, would have been inappropriate. Is that accurate? That's my, that's my philosophy, personally, yes. Okay. So when you go back, and you break and well, let me ask you this: When you went, when you came home from the prepaid legal convention, were you thinking, "Okay, it's time to break up with Daryl"? Um, when I left convention, I was it was painful because I knew that there were changes on my horizon, and Daryl would be one of them. I just was it was difficult for me to make that decision because I loved him a lot, but. It was not, it didn't fit my future anymore because he didn't want the same things I wanted. So when you broke up with him, 
Did you sit down and talk face to face in your home? Yes, we sat at the kitchen table. Okay. And in terms of that breakup, was there yelling and screaming? No, there was none of that. Just a civil conversation. And in terms of how the relationship ended, it sounds like you would have been the one who at least initiated this conversation. Is that correct? That's right. Overall, to me, answer. Yes, I asked if we could talk, and we sat down at the table. Okay. Now, at this point in time, you and Mr. Brewer still own the home in Palm Desert together. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Okay. And it sounded like from your previous testimony that you still had a lot of uh, bills to deal with and that sort of thing together, mutual bills. Yes, utilities, mortgage. Mm -hmm. After you broke up with Daryl, how long did the two, the two of you obviously didn't have uh, other places to live at the time of this conversation? Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. We only had the house for living arrangements. Okay. So do you both stay in that house for some time? He stayed until early December, and then he moved back to the Monterey Peninsula. Okay. So we're talking about, after this breakup, we're talking about approximately four months, or well, three months, I guess, of cohabitating and not being a couple. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And was there romantic or sexual interaction between the two of you after this uh, conversation? No sexual. The only one romantic gesture he did is before he hopped in his truck and pulled out of town, he kissed me on the lips. I wasn't expecting that, but that was the last time that we had any kind of contact of a romantic nature. Okay. The time period between you broke up and the, and the moment in time you just told us about him pulling away in his truck, was the relationship between you and Mr. Brewer would you describe it as civil? Definitely. And you were dating, to some degree, you were dating Mr. Alexander during this time period. Is that accurate? I would say we were seeing each other, but we were not boyfriend-girlfriend. Okay. And to your knowledge, was Mr. Brewer dating anyone at this, this period of time? To my knowledge, no. Did you feel the need to hide your dating or, or budding relationship uh, with Mr. Alexander? Did you want to keep that from Mr. Brewer? I wanted to keep that from him out of, out of being sensitive to his feelings and concerned for how. I didn't want to parade another guy in front of him, so to speak. After he moved away, did you still need to discuss bills and, and things related to the house? Yes. Okay. Uh, apart from having needing to have these uh, business type discussions, were you and Mr. Brewer, would you characterize your relationship with him during this period of time as a friendship? With Daryl, yes. And that chain of friendship, if you will, that began even back in 2006, it's still together today. Is, it, is that fair to say? Yes, we're not close, but we're still on friendly terms. And going back to what we talked about earlier with Matt, uh, who you view, you said, like, as a brother-like figure, you're still friends with 
Matt today to some degree. Is that accurate? The same. We're not close, um, but we're still friends. Okay. Now, we heard uh, when you were questioned about your breakup with Travis uh, that occurred on June 29th. And what year was that again? Is that 07? Yes, 2007. Okay. This was a telephone call, this breakup, right? Yes. Okay. And was, you testified that the next day, in responding to the questions, that you were back on the phone with Travis. Is that accurate? Yes. Why were you back? I mean, you've broken up. It would seem natural that perhaps some distance might be in order. Did you want distance? Um, well, we were distant as far as physical distance because I was in Big Sur, California. He was in Mesa, Arizona. But I don't know. I guess I wanted us... I wanted the same thing eventually, which was to be able to be friends with him. But we just had broken up less than 24 hours previous, and I was still in love with him. So I was conflicted, obviously, because I no longer trusted him. You also mentioned, I think the part that makes it a little harder to understand is the part about the fact that the phone conversation got sexual the very day after you broke up. Objection. That makes it a little hard to understand. May continue. This sexual conversation with him you had the day after you broke up, you freely engaged in it, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Why would you? engage in this conversation after breaking up with him the day before and and for the reasons that you broke up with, with him for, on the day before it goes back to the day before when i broke up with him he was making promises that he would change he said that he loved me and so the conversation didn't start sexual it started sentimental and then it moved into more of um, a sexual nature, I guess. He was complimenting me like, you're so hot, that kind of thing. Um, so I just kept talking to him because it was pleasant and he was saying nice things. And then at one point I became aware of the fact that he was masturbating while we were having this conversation. And I was in the driveway of the Red House at Fontana. Why did you have this conversation? Not to Sorry. Why did you keep going? After you, why did you keep engaging in this conversation when, as you say, you perceived him to be masturbating? I don't know. I guess a part of me felt I had very low self esteem at the time, and a part of me felt um, he still values me above other people, I guess that he still is attracted to me even though, and he's trying to win me back and all these things. So I was kind of flattered by it, I guess. Okay. Now the issue uh, came up regarding um, what were termed as suicide letters. Do you recall that coming up earlier today? Yes. I want to show you 
you exhibit being 514, 515, 516, 517, 518, 519, 520, and 521. Without speaking to the content, could you just review these uh, exhibits and verify for us that those were the letters you were referencing uh, this morning? Yes. They are. They are the letters. I they read. are those, sui those suicide letters you were referencing earlier. They're suicide letters and a drawing of what I wanted my Church grave to say. Okay. And Miss Arius, showing you what's been entered as exhibit. 510. You had been looking at that of 82607. You've been contemplating suicide for quite some time, hadn't you? Sustained. You've been contemplating suicide since. August 26, 2007. Yes, during that time period after I moved to Wairika, I feel like. Has she been contemplating it since that page? The answer was yes. The state. You've been contemplating it from August 26, 2007 till the time of your arrest? No, there was a break. But and what was the break? After I moved out of Arizona, I didn't feel suicidal. Um, 
as much until after Travis passed away. And so, just so we're clear, we're talking about when you left uh, Arizona in the U-Haul uh, in late March or April of 2008, correct? Yes. There was a question uh, posed to you about what I believe to be this journal entry and also in Exhibit 510 about how you were staying in Rachel's uh, tonight. Do you recall that? Yes. And being asked about that particular minute or that particular a journal entry? Yes. Okay. Is that a minimization that you were talking about? Objectionably. Overruled. Um, it was not very specific as to the reasons Travis would be upset. Um, I didn't go into those reasons. I was just voicing a few thoughts. Your recollection, Ms. Arias, have you composed any journal entries uh, that relate to the uh, idea of not writing certain things in your journal because out of fear of what Mr. Alexander would think? Yes. Approach with Exhibit 522. Did you take a look at Exhibit? 522, please This is um, a journal entry that I wrote just a few weeks after, I can't see, after a few weeks um, after the argument that we had, um, where he wouldn't let me leave the room. Objection. If she wants to give a date, that's fine. But beyond that, I would object. The date. I remember the date. Well, the date that you wrote the entry. Oh, the date. I'm sorry. It's 11-5-07. And was that your entire entry for 11507? It appears that this is the this is entry is complete, and the next one it shows part of 116. Okay. I have no objection. Please admit it. And again, we're looking at a date of uh, Monday, November 5th, 2007. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, and you were describing for us 
Um, what this enter entry was actually subsequent to uh, one of the acts of violence that was perpetrated upon you. Is that accurate? Will you repeat that? I'm sorry. This entry was subsequent to one of the acts of violence that was perpetrated upon you. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, when he pushed me, yes. Which act? Overruled. You say he pushed you. We've talked about these incidents, so maybe if you could just give us a little more of the details of what specific incident you're talking of. Okay, it was, um, it was a night we had an argument in his bedroom. Um, it was the night that he wouldn't let me leave. I tried to get up and leave, and he stopped me and pushed me, and I fell down. I fell on my knees, um, and he basically demanded that I listen to what he was saying. And a short time later, I got up to leave again, and he did the same thing. Um, the third time I got up, I, he let me leave. He followed me, though, all the way out to the car, saying things behind me as I walked all the, all the way down the stairs, out the door, and out to the driveway. Um, so that was the same night that that happened. I want to draw your attention to um, there is a paragraph that begins with the number two. Do you see that there? Yes. Two nights ago? Yes. And, and I'll move it for you when need be, but if you could do, be so kind as to read uh, that uh, area to us. Two nights ago, I called Travis to say goodnight and write on the outset of the conversation, he made a point in making it clear to me that he didn't mean all of those harsh words he said the other day. Okay. Um, let me, looks like the sentence goes a little bit into the next page. Could you finish the sentence? And that he felt really bad. Okay. This uh, reference that you make on 11.5, to two nights ago and that he uh, said some mean things or harsh words uh, that he didn't mean. Is that related to this incident and the things he said about your family? Yes, the conversation of two nights previous that I say there is a conversation where we were referencing the argument of a week or two earlier to that, yes. Okay, so I want to make sure I understand you correctly. You had this argument or this incident with him where he's not letting you leave the room and saying some mean things about your family. But then it sounds like you had a conversation about that incident, uh, I guess what would be on November 3rd. Is that correct? Yes, that was after he found the negative things I wrote about it and made me tear it out. And I think it opened his eyes to some things. Okay. So this isn't a reference to the, 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 the violence in the bedroom. It's a reference to a conversation you had related, sometime later related to the violence in the bedroom and the removal of things from the diary. Yes, and then I documented that conversation two days later, which would be the fifth. Okay. All right. Could you read the next sentence for us? He asked that I forget he ever said any of those. All right. And that's referring to the words he said when? The night of that argument. Okay. The third. I'm oh, sorry? The third of November? The, that's what he said on the third, but he asked that I forget what he said on the night of the argument. Okay. Uh, part of forgiving, in my opinion, is, is to forget and let it go. But you're writing about it. Can you explain that to us? I'm not writing about the part that I want to forget. 
which are the words I'm writing more about the experience since, I, does that say Sunday on the 5th? Or, okay, Monday. The reason I'm writing on this topic is because that Sunday, it was a topic in RS's Relief Society, and that's, um, that was a topic in church. It's a, where the women meet for that hour about how once words are spoken, they can't be unspoken. And it just seemed along those themes, so I was journaling about that. Picking up right here where he says, even now, could you read that sentence for us? Even now, even still, I'm haunted by those words as another statement just popped into my mind. And again, just for clarification, are we talking about words that were said on the third or words that were said uh, during this violent altercation, or are we talking about both? Will you repeat that? I'm sorry. The words, you say, the words that were spoken uh, still haunt you. Yes. And so which words are you referring to? His harsh words during that time, it was still relatively fresh, and they kept playing like a recording in my mind over and over. So was, they were haunting me in that regard. You say that... Uh, Start reading from the sentences, I, I won't write it down. I won't write it down, however, as I promised to Travis that I wouldn't do so as part of forgetting it. When did you make that promise to him? The day that he tore out the entry where I wrote the negative things about that night, the night of the argument. Okay. And the, that is what we saw in terms of the pages that were removed from your diary a few days back? I don't think I, those were the specific ones, but they are in there. Yes, there were some pages torn out. All right. Now, referencing back, uh, you were asked a couple of different questions about uh, men whom you've had an in, whom you had an interest in in we'll say the spring of 2008 after you moved back to Wairika. Remember being asked about some of that? Yes. Okay. And you were you mentioned uh, an individual by the name of Steve Carroll. Yes. Okay. And if memory serves, that was an individual that you met through a website called LDS Linkup. Is that? Yes. Okay. And was this, seems to be implied in the name, but to your understanding, was this somewhat of a, a, a Mormon dating site? Not necessarily dating, it's a Mormon social networking site, so it could be for dating, friendship, family, any of that. Okay. And you, in the spring of 2008, even after breaking up with Travis, do you can still identify yourself as a member of the Mormon church, is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And you had mentioned that the church encouraged you to uh, date as much, uh, maybe date's not the right word, but to interact as much as possible. Is that accurate? Yes. Once you become an adult, a legal adult, um, the church encourages you, well, I don't know about teenage years as far as 18, 19, but definitely in, the tw in your 20s, your, the church is in encourages you to focus on the goal of marriage and find that person, and if you're not going to marry a certain person, not to, to put it bluntly, to waste your time with that person. And when we're also talking about interaction as well, we're talking about very um, innocent, if you will, dates. Yeah, I never physically met Steve Carroll. It was only online and brief. Um, but as far as dates, as far as the church policy, they encourage dating. 
um, as far as going out on dates in public places, not places where you might be led to, into temptation, that kind of thing. Okay. So in this time period then, in the spring of 2008, you would have been how old? 27. Okay. And we kind of heard at least how 30, 31, that kind of age was a magic number, if you will, for um, single Mormon men, correct? I wouldn't say a magic number. It's more like a dreaded number. Okay, a dreaded number. Uh, so you were at a point in time in your life at this time where uh, you were, were you also at a point in, in time in your life where you were also seeking marriage and family because you were getting close to this, this number, this dreaded number as well. Yes, um, I wasn't as close as Travis. The number applies to both men and women. Um, you're expected to be married by that age. Not everyone does get married by that age in the church, but it's more or less expected of you. And um, obviously I was getting closer by the day. And when I ultimately make the determination of whether or not I would want to spend my life with someone, I would need plenty of time with that person first. I can't just pick somebody and say, let's go. So. Or not she dreaded the date or she... Well, I guess one of the things that makes um, 30 uh, a dreaded number in your church is not turning 30, but it's turning 30 and being single. Is that accurate? Turning 31 and being unmarried. Okay. So... At age 27, you were, weren't seeking to avoid turning 30, but you were seeking to um, be married and start a family before that age. Is that accurate? Yes, 31. It's 31. Okay, 31. But yes, that's accurate. Okay. So in that regard, uh, you were maybe not exclusively, but part of the reason you're on LDS Link Up is to find a, a potential boyfriend or find a potential mate. Would that be accurate? Yeah, somebody that I might be able to progress with. Okay. So, and Mr. Carroll was one of those individuals at least you were interested in or early on or to some degree, right? I met Steve Carroll online sometime in she was interested in that one. Sorry. Was he a person that you were at least beginning to explore an interest in? Yes. Okay. Somewhat. And at that point in time, Mr. Dixon, we've heard about, was only a friend uh, and not a romantic interest because he was not a member of your church. Is that correct? Um, I can't say that my interest in him was not romantic, but it was, also, it was something that I would not pursue because he was not a member of the church. So I kind of put a stop loss on any feelings that may have developed had we gone that route, but we never did. Okay. And Mr. Burns was another individual, Ryan Burns, that you were interested in at this point in time as well. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. But I want to be clear as well, you weren't, you hadn't even met Mr. Carroll in person, correct? That's correct. We just emailed a few times. And apart from meeting Mr. Burns at a business meeting uh, in Oklahoma City, you had not met him in person again since that initial meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. A meeting I didn't even remember, actually. Okay. So, at that point in time, really, this spring of 2008, <clears throat> based on what you told us, would it be correct to assume you wouldn't have identified yourself as having a boyfriend at that period of time? That's correct. In that regard, 
in this period of time, what was Mr. Alexander to you? He was my ex-boyfriend. He was kind of like a best friend in a way because we were still very close. Um, the best way to put it is that it was complicated, but we were not in a committed relationship. Had any of these, <clears throat> well, you were still having sexual interaction with him, at least over the phone, uh, as we heard in May of 2008. That's accurate, right? Yes, that's accurate. Had you also talked about being sexually monogamous with uh, one person if you were dating them or they were your boyfriend, correct? Did you ask if I had talked about that? No, well, you, 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 yeah, you mentioned that before in your yes. testimony, that you were sexually monogamous in the context of, of a relationship. Yes, I am. And yes. a relationship is the only context, actually, that you've engaged in sexual activities. Is that correct? In a relationship? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Had things progressed with Mr. Carroll, Mr. Burns, or anyone else, would that have meant the end of the sexual interaction with Mr. Alexander? It would have, he would have been cut off. I think you had mentioned an all access pass that would have transferred to somebody else, I guess you could say. Okay. To your knowledge, did Travis know that? He knew that I was loyal, and he knew Seriously. that. Did he know it? Yes or no? To your knowledge, did Travis know that you were loyal? Yes. And I'm sorry. I, I said yes. I'm sorry. Talking about the trip that you began on June 2nd, did, was Travis aware of your plans to go to Utah? Yes. And based on your belief, do you believe he might have sensed that you were going there for exploring another potential boyfriend? Objection, speculation. As her belief, Judge. <coughs> yes, because he teases me about it on the tape. Um, Objection, when, she was asked whether or not it's a yes or no question, whether or not he sensed it. Why did you sense that he had this suspicion? Um, when I mentioned I was going to Utah, he kind of was asking, well, why are you going to Utah? And I told him to see friends. Sustained. He was inquisitive about the purposes of your trip. Would that be accurate to say? He was inquisitive, yes. And based on the verbiage he used, you believe this, his inquisitive nature related to assuring that this trip didn't involve another guy? I don't know about assuring, but it related to his desire to find out if that's what it was about. You were also asked about uh, your, as it relates to the trip, the gas cans. That's 
a few different questions about the gas can. But the one I want to focus in on, Jody, is the question related to uh, a, a response you made related to getting the gas cans from, from Daryl. Do you remember being asked about getting the gas cans from Daryl? Yes. Okay. Was taking gas cans on a trip, and, and, and your answer uh, seemed to be, was something to the effect that that was common practice for you. Is that accurate? Only after we moved to the desert and realized the extreme conditions of the desert in the summer. I didn't take them on all the trips, just within desert areas. For example, if I was going to Portland, I wouldn't take gas cans. Okay. Now, as it relates to this, this trip and kind of what was going on and the interaction you were having in this time period with Travis, you were questioned about the trip that Mr. Alexander was going to take to Cancun. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. Okay. And you were also asked uh, to some degree or, or earlier about uh, this woman uh, that you saw Travis making out with in, uh, and I'm going to use the word making out, for simplicity in his home. Do you recall being asked about that? Yes. Okay. And over the course of, of your relationship, uh, not perhaps when he was doing it, but did you know that Mr. Alexander was dating a girl whose name at the time was Lisa Andrews? Not while he was dating her. I found out afterward. Okay. But, but during the course, you found out afterwards, meaning, but still during the course of, of your relationship. During the course of? And I should be careful here. During the course, when I said relationship, uh, I should have said friendship with, with Mr. Alexander. Yeah, whatever our relationship would be defined as. Yes, I found out during that time, I guess. And when you found out, that didn't end, the sex didn't end. Is that accurate? I think we did have sex, because I found out two days before I pulled out of town, so I think we did sleep together again after that fight. Okay. So in a few days you pulled out of town, meaning when you moved to Wairika? Um, yes, a few days, because it happened the same day that he choked me. And, well, obviously, we know that it didn't stop because you had sexual relations with him on June 4th, or with Travis Alexander on June 4th as well, right? Yes. And you had, even after you had this knowledge about him dating Lisa Andrews, you also engaged in phone sex conversations with him, correct? Yes. Okay. While I'm on the topic of phone sex conversations, a, a, a question was posed to you uh, about whether or not you had recorded uh, other phone sex conversations with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that? I think that happened yesterday. Yes. And you said that you had recorded those conversations, if I recall correctly. Is that right? That's right. Do you know what became of those? Um, after June 4th, I deleted them. And just so we're clear, was this on the same phone that the May 10th recording was found on or on a different phone that you deleted these recordings? It was on the phone that was replaced by the, the phone that the May 10th recording was on that phone. I believed it was stolen a week later, so I got another replacement phone through the insurance that I had on the phone. And so the subsequent recordings were on that phone. And then after everything happened, I deleted it to, well, one, it's embarrassing as hell, but two, I didn't want that to be known about Travis either. Okay. 
So we know about uh, Lisa Andrews and the girl that was uh, standing outside the window. You also, and, I, and without going into names, you also mentioned that Travis had an interest in uh, having a threesome during your relationship. Is that correct? Yes. And that involved another woman, correct? Yes. Okay. And you told us that that was something that you were, I believe your words were, willing to go along with. I'm not sure if it had gone up, gone up to the moment, if I would have gone along with it or not, but I entertained the idea with him. Okay. And on this phone call as well, before we talk about the phone call, uh, you had told us that you knew about the trip to Cancun, I think it was, you said, somewhere in the ballpark of a year before it was to take place. Is that correct? Yes. It was announced right around the time that he and I broke up. Okay. Was uh, there any point in time when Mr. Alexander had asked you to accompany him to Cancun? No, never. And did the idea of going to Cancun with Mr. Alexander, was that something that you ever, did you ever ask him, I'd like to go to Cancun with you or something to that effect? No, I never asked him anything like that. Okay. When did you know that Travis was dating or had an interest in Murray Hall? It was sometime in late winter, early spring, 2008. It was sometime somewhere in the first quarter of 2008, I would say, but it was before we went to convention. I remember that. And you still uh, engaged in, in sexual behavior with Mr. Alexander even after that knowledge, correct? Correct, yes. And at some point in time, well, you knew that his interest in her, was it your understanding that his interest in her was more than fleeting, shall we say? At first, um, he didn't tell me a lot. He just showed me pictures of her. And then after that, I understood that he believed that he was receiving signs from God that she was to be his wife. When he showed you pictures of her, was it with also the expression that uh, he had a romantic interest in her? Yes. Do you recall if that, uh, do you recall when that happened? When he showed me the pictures? Yes. Oh, uh, it would have been in early 2008. I don't recall exactly the month even. Okay. Why, in your half of the equation then, you, you, you know that he's interested in this other woman, are you still interested in, are you still willing, I should say, to engage in sexual behavior with Mr. Alexander? Well, I was conflicted. Um, they weren't dating like officially exclusively. Um, they were not boyfriend, girlfriend, that was my understanding. They had gone on two dates or three. Um, so I didn't feel like I was enabling him to cheat on her by any means, but at the same time, I also was conflicted with the idea that what we're doing is not 
helping either of us spiritually, especially if he thinks he just met his future wife. So it was, I was conflicted. The conflict that you described that you were going through, and I, I know you can't read Travis's mind, but were you of the understanding that that he was conflicted as well, or was he simply just still interested in, in, in engaging in sex with you? Conflicted about what? Well, he has this girl, shows you a picture, says this is gonna be my future wife. That's what you just described for us, right? Yeah, not when he showed me the picture, but he did share that with me, yes. Okay. Yet, he never stopped, based on what we heard in May 10th, and through your testimony, he, ne he never, to your understanding, lost a desire to have sex with you. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. When you saw this picture of Marie Hall, and he says, this is going to be my future wife, are you jealous? I didn't feel jealous. And he didn't say, this is going to be my future wife. He just said, this is a girl he's interested in. Um, but when he began to talk about her, I can't say it was jealousy. It was kind of bittersweet, because I knew that I wasn't going to marry him. But I still had feelings for him, and I knew I needed to move on. Um, and I knew our relationship was unhealthy. So I still have feelings for him, but it's more like bittersweet, because I still have a desire for him to be happy, as well as me to be happy. Okay. And you mentioned you, know, you, you knew you weren't going to marry Travis. There's conversation on the tape about, you know, marrying other people and whether they will live up to your sexual relationship that you had with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that discussion being on the tape? Yes. Okay. So even as late as May, if of 2008, you knew you weren't going to marry Travis. You had no desire to marry Travis. Is that accurate? I knew I wasn't going to marry him, and I can't say that I had a desire to marry the Travis that I knew as Travis to be at that point. Yes, that's accurate. Okay. The fact that, well, Back in 2008, in the spring of 2008, you said Travis never asked you to go to Cancun. Did you have a, a, a passport at that time? Yes. You could have gone? Okay. Did you have ever, as it got into May and, and June of 2008, did you have ever have any expectations that you would be going on this trip? No, it was never a discussion. Because international travel would take some preparation, correct? Yes. Were you jealous in any way that he was taking Miss Hall to Cancun? I didn't know he was taking Mimi Hall until after June 4th. Until after June 4th? Yes. Did you ever, without telling us his response, did you ever inquire what who are you taking? I did mention it after I moved back to Irika, and that's how, that's when he mentioned the babysitter of his friends. Okay. And he didn't tell you the name of this babysitter? No, just that it was a trade-off for debt he owed. Okay. Now, you spoke about in response to one of the, the questions about having unconditional love for Travis. Do you remember speaking about that? Yes. And would it be fair to say you still have that today? Yes.
you were asked a couple of questions about your ability and reasons to stay with Mr. Alexander after a couple events. One of those events was when he had sex with you while you were asleep. Remember being asked that? Yes. My question to you then is, it, was it that unconditional love that allowed you to keep being with him even after that point in time? There may have been an element of that, but it was more because at that time I was in love with him, so, and I was already familiar with him physically, emotionally, um, his personality, all that. I was familiar with him in a lot of ways, so when that happened, um, and because I was in love with him, it didn't feel like he had violated me in a big way. Like it was something that just happened not necessarily intentionally, kind of by accident, oops, let's move on and not do that again, was kind of how I looked at it. The question that I guess, if, if you could describe for us, what do you mean, how, I asked you about unconditional love and you said you know it was because you loved him. Uh, what's, the, what's the difference in your mind? Between unconditional between, love and being in love? No, between, between love or being in love, however you want to phrase it, and this unconditional love that you speak of. Well, I think there are different kinds of love. I have unconditional love for my family members, friends. Um, I think I mentioned before that I have a certain, like there's an advancement, I guess you could say, I have a certain amount of love for everybody. Um, Travis, it was a deeper unconditional love because I had... Um, personally inside I had a desire to see him be happy um, and then being in love is more a little more intense it um, it's some I, I've never been in love with more than one person at a time so it's an individual thing or experience for me and um, it feels good that kind of thing okay you mentioned um, well you were asked about being able to stay with him after seeing what you saw him do in January 2008. Was that being in love or was that the unconditional love that allowed that to keep going? I don't know how much I was still in love with him by that time. There was definitely unconditional love and it was strong. Um, I'd say there was still an in-love element there, but it wasn't as strong as it had been nine months earlier. It sort of began to wane a little bit. Okay. You were asked about uh, Travis and his sex and its correlation to anger and um, the de-stressing that was brought up in your answer. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And I want to know a little more clarification when you say, and you, you made a comment that this was like code in your relationship. De-stress was like a code, right? Right. Okay. So uh, maybe you could help us by breaking that code, what de-stressing meant. De-stressing means to relieve stress in any form through sex. Okay. Through any form of sex. No, through any form of stress, through sex, I guess any form. Whatever meant his climax because that would help him relax. Okay. You also mentioned that, all, uh, that this system, if you will, this relaxation, uh, also correlated to his anger. Do you recall talking about that yesterday? Yes. Okay. So can you explain that to us? Yes. Sometimes we would argue, and if sex followed that immediately after the argument, it signaled the end of the argument. Um, there were times, like when the fight where he wouldn't let me leave, um, I left finally, and he called me to come back and 
I came back and we had sex and we were done fighting. So it changed the mood, the atmosphere, the energy, um, and it put him in a better mood. Okay. If, if you can, I want to I want to see if we can use an example that you've talked about during the course of this trial and this um, anger, the the end of anger through sex that you talked about. Do you remember telling us about on June 4th, how after the CD didn't work, you threw the CD, on, or he threw the CD on the ground, and eventually this led to him grabbing you by the arm and bending you over the desk. Do you recall telling us about that incident? Yes, but to be clear, he checked the CD at the wall, like it was on his desk. He hit the wall, probably most, not much farther than this desk, and it it rolled backward. Okay. But you know the incident we're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. You had made a comment to us that you were okay with this activity, the sexual activity, because it was an alternative to him getting more angry or perhaps physical. Is that correct? Yes. Is that then a illustration of what you're talking about related to sex and anger? Yes, that's another example. Okay. And as it relates to June 4th, and what happened in the bathroom, sex as a way of quelching this anger was never an option to you in the bathroom. Is that accurate? Yes, it stained. Was sex an option available to you after you dropped the camera on June 4th as a way to de-stress Mr. Alexander? Uh, definitely not immediately. It certainly wasn't in the heat of that moment. You were asked about uh, the gun when you learned of the gun. Do you recall being asked that? I think that happened yesterday. Yes. And you said that you became aware of that in 2007 when you were working as his uh, housekeeper, correct? Correct. What was your understanding of how Mr. Alexander had acquired that gun? My understanding of how he got the gun is that it, my understanding is that his father used to. No, it's her understanding, it's not his statements. Hearsay. Approach, please.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 320. Please remember the admonition, you are excused. record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Ms. Arias, you may step down. Counsel, please approach. You want to you want to look at yeah let me just get that.
No, Your Honor, I wish it, this, the state to expand upon the, their argument is not, uh, it's a person sense of impression, Your Honor, it's a hearsay exception. All right, I have not seen the letters. For Martinez, you've had a chance to look at them. What's the state's position? Uh, they are hearsay and do not meet a counsel's description of a present sense impression. There has to be an action uh, in conformity therewith, is my understanding, and she's still here. Counsel, please approach.
Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nurmi, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Arias, the gun you discovered Mr. Alexander owning, was that, was it your understanding that his ownership of said gun was to be kept secret? Yes. Now, continuing on the line of questions, uh, you were asked, as it relates to June 4th, uh, there was a question about you deleting photos from the camera. Do you remember hearing that question? Yes. And we heard early in your testimony in this regard that you were budding professional photographer, correct? Yes. And being such, were you familiar with the operation of a digital camera? Yes. To your knowledge, how and or where are images on a digital camera saved? On the memory card. Okay. Now, in terms of your understanding prior to June 4th, if an image was deleted off a camera, were you of the belief that it simply went away for good? No, as a digital photographer, my understanding is that. How she would know this technical aspect. She's trying to answer the question. Have a role to me answer. As a digital photographer, my understanding is that the image stays on the card, um, but it's not something that the average person can recover. You can't, you can't get it back, but unless you have a lot of money to get it back. Did you ever have experience to try to? Well, no. Let me rephrase that. Um, based on the fact that we saw the camera in the washing machine and it had a memory card in it, you didn't take it, the camera with you, did you? Objection meeting. Overruled. Me No, I did not take it with me. Now it was question of you regarding Mr. Alexander shaving. Do you remember that? Yes. And I think you asked specifically about um, exhibit 503 and the picture you took of him shaving. <coughs> Remember seeing that picture a couple days ago? Yes. Okay. You had made the commentary that Mr. Alexander uh, shaved the old fashioned way. When you made that commentary, were you talking about the old hot towel and razor treatment or were you talking more about just a razor in general? I guess when I saw the shave cream, it just reminded me of the old fashioned way. I know that sounds silly because shaving cream is always used, but that's what I meant when I said that. Okay. You were also asked about your, the gun coming into your hands that you grabbed from this closet, correct? Correct. Okay. And your testimony was that the gun was 
up in this area somewhere, correct? In the corner, correct. Okay. Now, you were asked about whether or not it was in a holster or not. Do you recall that for sure? On the day of... She asked about the gun and she indicated it was in a holster. It was stained. Are you sure that it was in a holster? On the day of, I don't remember whether it was in the holster or not. When I first discovered it, I don't recall seeing it in a holster, but at one point it was in a holster. Yes. Now, you were asked about some of the cleanup efforts you made. Did you ever, to your recollection, straighten anything up in the closet? Not to my recollection. You also mentioned as it relates to this, or you were also asked, I suspect, uh, as it relates to this incident, this uh, question of cocking the firearm doing anything to it, and you said you didn't recall doing anything of that nature. Do you recall saying that? Yes, I really don't remember. Okay. But you mentioned, I think your word was that you had some familiarity with guns. Do you recall saying that? Yes. Could you explain to us what you mean, what you meant by that? Yes, I never had any formal training, but uh, Daryl and I used to go camping at Kirk Creek in Big Sur, California, um, every summer, and he brought his gun, and as a safety precaution, he showed me where the safety was. Um, I think it's called a magazine, where the, all the bullets are, and how to cock it and that kind of thing. Um, I know there are different kinds of guns, but that's kind of the extent of the familiarity I had, and also the um, shop owner who sold me my 9 millimeter. well, I guess we're talking prior June 4th, so that was after. But other than that, I had a general familiarity, but not, I know that guns, each gun type is, is a little different, so I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you too much about it, just more than much beyond point and shoot kind of thing. You were also asked about where uh, various items went on June 4th. Um, the camera uh, being one of them as it relates to this photograph. Does this photograph uh, display for us where the gun was? Does it, is that area covered in the photograph? The gun? No. Or excuse me, the camera. Yes. Could you uh, point to that where the camera went? I was right about, the mat used to be right about here and I dropped it on the mat and kind of bounced by the tub. Okay. This object here, Yes, that one. Is, is that the mat? Yes. Okay. Now, for sake of clarification, since we've been talking about mats, was there a separate one for the shower and one for the tub, or is it just one mat? I don't recall there being a mat for the tub. So this mat, were, were you at one point in time then is kneeling on this mat when you're taking the photographs? Yes. Okay. Now you were asked about the knife. The knife, to your recollection, was the knife ever with you in your car? Not at any point in time, ever, to my knowledge and recollection. Did you 
ever have any knowledge or recollection of disposing of this knife at any point in time? Not disposing of it. The only vague recollection I have is putting a knife in the dishwasher. And again, I'm not sure if I'm confusing that with another time or if it was that day. It's okay. You were asked various questions about June 4th as it related to some other incidents uh, that you'd experienced with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that? Yes. Related to other violent incidents? Yes. Okay. And one of the th things that came up is your response to these questions in whole was that this was different. He kept coming. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. My question to you as it relates in comparison to these other incidents was the fear that you had on June 4th also different? It, yes, it was different in that it was, it wasn't just fear, it was mortal fear. Like, I thought I was gonna die. And if you can, can you describe for us why you felt like you were gonna die? It goes back to the choking incident and the fact that when he body slammed me and he was standing over me, again, I thought he was trying to get on top of me. And even when we fell, I felt he still was trying to get on top of me by grabbing at me. Okay. You were also asked about shaking during the course of this trial. Do you recall being asked about that? I think that was this morning you were asked about that. Um, yes. And you said that you were shaking during your cross-examination, I believe you said the first day, correct? Yeah, I think there were, tr I was shaking all the days, but most prominently on the first day of cross. Now, when you say shaking, what part of you was shaking? Um, my whole body trembles. Um, like, for example, when I wasn't talking, I had my, my jaw muscles hurt because I had my teeth clenched because my teeth would have been chattering so I was shaking that much. And sometimes I'll sit on my hands because I feel like they're shaking. And there were a few times when I wanted to reach for the water, but I knew that it would be visible and I'm, it's kind of embarrassing. I didn't want the state to know that, that he was affecting me that way. And so I just waited until I was, I felt like I could reach for the water without it make, making it obvious. So you attempted to hide the shaking from everyone in the courtroom? Yeah, I, I tense my whole body so that I'm not shaking. Just, I try to, like, have a physical control over it, although it's, sometimes it's difficult. This sensation of tensing your body so you didn't shake, did you ever do that when Mr. Alexander was being physically violent with you? I don't recall attempting to stop it the way I, I try to now, but... Um, I don't know. Okay. One issue uh, that came up in a few of the questions a little bit yesterday and this morning uh, was the issue of shame. Do you recall discussing that? Yes. And I think you were asked something to the effect that, well, if you it killed in self-defense, and maybe this is what you had done wrong. Uh, but there were some questions about shame as well in this regard. So I want to make sure we're clear. What 
are you ashamed of as it relates to June 4th, 2008? I'm ashamed that that I did what I did. I'm ashamed that I'm the person that that did that. Um, I, I was ashamed beyond, beyond that. I was ashamed of some of the things that Travis and I did. Um, but more than shame, I was very horrified with myself. And I just never in my life imagined that I would be pushed to that point or capable of being pushed to that point or that that would be something that I would do. Because I, I was a person who loved all life and And this is kind of an, the extreme opposite. It, it would appear that way. I don't. I didn't feel that way, but it, it looks that way, and I was very ashamed of it. You were also asked. Well, let, let me preface this by saying that. You know, you've admitted throughout the course of your testimony. Uh, these these past few weeks. You've admitted that you lied about uh, being there to Detective Flores, to, to the world, in essence, to some degree, right? Yes. And then when confronted with evidence, you lied uh, about your, your presence there. You lied to Detective Flores and, and ultimately on national TV by saying uh, the two intruders came in the home and uh, had caused Mr. Alexander's death. You recall doing that and admitting to lying about that? Yes. And you perpetrated that lie, as we've heard throughout this trial, for a long time. Isn't that correct? Throughout the trial, no, but throughout the case. No, throughout the case. Yes. Given all these lies, you were asked an important question. Why should anyone believe you now? Remember being asked that? Yes. So, Jody, that is the ultimate question. Why should anybody believe you now? Like I said before, all of my, I lied a lot in the beginning, and each of those lies tied back directly to two things. Travis and protecting his ego, I mean, his reputation. Um, and my own partially, and to related to any involvement in his death. So I understand that there will always be questions, but all I can do at this point is say what happened to the best of my recollection. And if I'm convicted, then that's because of my own bad choices in the beginning. And relevance and base the province of the jury. Sustained. No further questions. Martinez, you may follow up. Ma'am, one of the things that you told us was that um, you are going to tell the truth, the whole truth, throughout this proceeding. Do you remember that when you took the oath? Yes, to the best of my recollection. Uh, am I asking you to the best of your recollection that you took the oath, ma'am? Objection, argumentative judge. Sustained. Ma'am, do you remember standing in front of the clerk to Judge Stevens left and being sworn in. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember being asked, will you tell the truth, the whole truth? Do you remember being told that? Yes. And you swore that you would, right? Yes. One of the questions that was brought up during um, the questioning by the jury and also by your defense attorney involved your allegation involving Mr. Alexander's, or your claim of Mr. Alexander's alleged pedophilia. Do you remember that? 
That's correct. And this is a claim that you have alleged that it involved uh, January 21st of 2008, right? Yes. And you were asked by one of the jurors, well, ma'am, did you tell anybody else about this alleged claim of pedophilia? And you said, well, yeah. Do you remember saying that you did? Yes. And do you remember that you kind of, at that point, hesitated and you turned to the jury and you said, yes, I did tell a psychologist, right? Yes. And you also indicated that you may have told somebody else, right? Yes. And with regard to these somebody else's, who are they? Matt McCartney. All right. Uh, and Matt McCartney is this individual that is your friend, right? He is a friend of mine, yes. He's a person who will not betray you, correct? My confidence, yes. And he's somebody he, who, well, in the 48 hours interview, that's how you described him, someone who will not betray you, correct? Right, when I confide in him. Y yes or no? Yes. In the 48 hours interview that we saw, is it true that you said that he's an individual that will not betray you? That's correct. Additionally, didn't it also indicate that he's an ally? You indicated that he was an ally of yours, right? Yes. And this individual, Matt McCartney, is somebody who will also lie for you, won't he? No, he would never do that. Overall. He would never do that. Are you aware of the statements that he made in January of 2008, I'm sorry, in January of 2013, involving that very fact, yes or no? Objection, Your Honor, just get on the scope of the questions. Your approach. You may. May I proceed? And Matthew McCartney is this individual who is your ally, though, right? Was. Stay. Now, you said that you would tell us the whole truth, right? Do you remember that you would say involving this pedophilia thing? Do you remember telling us yes. that? Well, you did tell us that you spoke to. Initially, you said, well, I did tell a therapist. Do you remember telling us that, right? Say what? Initially, you testified that you told a therapist, correct? He was not a therapist. Yeah. Okay. A psychologist. How about yes. that? Yes. Even though this psych... Can we approach? You may. Overruled. And that you did make this statement to this psychologist. You told us about that earlier, right? Yes. Well, this is the one of the psychologists is Richard Samuels that you told, right? That was not the psychologist. Ma'am, I didn't ask you if that was one of the psychologists, did I? 
That's how I interpret it, so I guess not. I'm not asking you to interpret anything. If you don't understand the question, ask me, and we will repeat it for you. The question was, do you understand that? Yes. With regard to this issue, isn't it true that one of the people that you told about this was Richard Samuels, correct? Yes. And this individual, Richard Samuels, is someone who is assisting in your defense, correct? Yes. And you also told Alice Laviolette, right? Yes. And these individuals, Alice Laviolette, for example, she's also going to testify on your behalf, correct? That's my understanding. Do you have any reason to believe that she's not going to testify on your behalf? Over both. Um, no. She's interviewed you, right? Yes. And you've talked to her about this alleged pedophilia, correct? That's correct. And you told her what it was that you knew about the pedophilia, right? I don't remember how in-depth we discussed it, but I did tell her some you things did? about it. Yes. It's fair to say, for example, the statements that you made to Richard Samuels were made years after um, this case began to be prosecuted, correct? Possibly, yes. I don't remember the exact time frame. Well, it was in 2011 that you talked to him about it, wasn't it? No, it was 2010, early. Oh, so you do remember that it was in 2010. So that was years after this case began to be prosecuted, right? I believe it was, yes. Well, you just told me 2010. Are you going to go back on that, or are you going to stay with that answer? Which one do you want? Stay. I think I'm trying to remember when I told him, but we began to meet, I think, within a year after. I'm not sure. So you speak to this individual. Isn't it to your benefit to start saying these kinds of things? I don't think so. I think it's mortifying. Oh, so you think that it's to your detriment, then, to come in here to court and talk about Mr. Alexander masturbating to a picture of a young person, a young girl, boy. Do you, you think that that's to your detriment? I don't know if it's my benefit or detriment. I just know it's the truth. I'm not asking you if it's the truth, am I? No. I'm asking you whether that's not, isn't that to your benefit? I don't know if it's to my benefit or my detriment. Why bring it up, then, if it isn't going to be of any use to you? I swore to tell everything that I remember. Pardon? I didn't hear you. Are you talking about here or with Richard Samuels? I'm talking about right here. Why bring it up if it's not going to help you? Because it was asked. Oh, I see. So, now, so you are saying now that if it were up to you, you wouldn't have brought that up. Yes, be honest, Um, I don't know. So... You didn't, even later after that, you spoke to Alice Laviolette about it, right? After Samuels? Sure. Um, it was after I first met Samuels, but I think their visits have been somewhat contemporaneous. So you think that you met Alice Laviolette at the same time that you met Mr. Samuels? Is that correct? No, yes, I said it. Her testimony. Sustained. You did tell Alice Laviolette about this, right? Correct. And... This was even years beyond the time that you talked to Mr. Samuels, correct? I don't know. It was after, but I don't know what years. And again, it was to your benefit because you're saying that you were a, you're saying that you're a victim of domestic violence to bring this up, right? I'm not saying it's to my benefit or detriment. It was asked of me. And. Um, you just went along and you did what you were told. Is that what you're saying? I I'm guessing argumentative. Oh, for speculation. World. I just answered questions. And so you're telling me that, yes, you did what you were told, kind of like I'm with the interview with, um, first, with uh, first Edition or whatever it was. Inside Edition. I'm argumentative. Distinct. Did you, so you're saying that if it, just to be clear, are you saying that you would or would not have brought it up? It really depends on the time frame because I didn't want to ever bring it up. And then... Well, ma'am, we're talking about right now. Oh, I couldn't say, Pardon? honestly. I, I really couldn't say. You couldn't say? No. It's not a memory issue, you just can't say, right? It's not really 
a preference or not a preference that I've explored or thought about in my mind. I'm just answering questions. But immediately after it happened in January of 2008, you didn't tell anybody, right? Definitely not. And you were arrested on July 15th of 2008, and you didn't tell the detective, right? No. You had another conversation with the detective on July 16th of 2008, and you didn't tell him anything either, right, about this thing, right? That's correct. Um, whatever happened after that, you then say that you told somebody else, right? You then stated as part of a question from the jury that you did tell somebody else, right? Um, yes, but not in that order. I understand that. You remember the jury asking you a question about it, and you kind of looked over the, at them and you said, yes, I did tell somebody else. Do you remember telling them that? Yes. When was this that you told somebody else? April 2008. What was that again? April 2008. And who was it that you told in April of 2008 about this? Matt McCartney. So again, it's Mr. McCartney that you told, besides Mr. McCartney. Oh, the other, the doctor? No. At, we were talking, let's do it this way. Do you remember we were talking about July 15th of 2008 and your arrest? Do you mean July 21st? You think you were arrested on July 21st of uh, I'm 2000? sorry, I was thinking you said January. July 15th, yes. Let's go back to the date of your arrest. You were arrested on July 15th of 2008, weren't you? Yes. And you had a conversation with the detective on that date, right? Yes. You were also had another conversation with the detective on July 16th of 2008, right? Yes. And you didn't tell him anything about this, right? That's correct. You did say, though, when you were asked a question by the jurors about this, that after that, you did tell a psychologist about it. Do you remember answering that question to the jurors? Yes. When did you tell the psychologist about this issue involving the pedophilia? I think it was... July 2009, I believe. And I'm not sure of the month, but it was 2009. You think it was July 2009? I'm not and entirely what's the sure of the month. That you told to this to. Um. You may.
You may proceed. So what was the thing that you told this other individual for the first time about these allegations of pedophilia against Mr. Alexander? It wasn't the first time that I told somebody, but the individual you're referring to is, it was somewhere in 2009. I don't remember the exact month. It's difficult for you know which, to know which individual I'm referring to. Wouldn't you agree, ma'am? I know which guy. I just can't remember his name. He's a doctor out of San Diego. Okay. But the person before that that you told according to you is Matthew McCarthy, right? That's correct. One of the things that we know, ma'am, is that you told us that, well, when you decided to take this trip, that you contacted Mr. Brewer because you wanted to take some, get some gas cans for him, right? Yes. It's been established that there were two gas cans each with the capacity of five gallons or a little bit over, right? That's my understanding. Well, you were there, right? Yes. And you filled them up in Pasadena, didn't you? It mischaracterizes her testimony. I'm sorry. Three people talking at once. What is your objection? Objection. It mischaracterizes her testimony. She said never said five gallons or more. Overruled. You may proceed. OK. You were the one that filled these cans up with gasoline in Pasadena, according to you, right? I put gas in them. I don't know that I filled them to the brim because I was worried about their flammability. You were the one, though, that put the gasoline into these two gas cans, correct? Correct. And you were the one that paid for them, right? Yes. And ma'am, you were the one that also put gas in your car, right? Yes. In response to a question from the jury, this issue was brought up as to what happened first or whether or not there were three cans. Do you remember three gas cans? Do you remember that line of questioning? Not the sequence, but the matter of three gas cans. Do you remember that this issue was brought up about whether or not you filled up your, can your car up with gas first or put the gas into the gas cans first? Do you remember even testifying about that I this remember morning? Testifying about you, that. Hold on, this morning. Do you remember testifying about that? Yes. And you indicated that, well, previously to that, that you didn't know which one had happened first, whether or not you'd put the, the gas into the car first or whether you'd put the gas into the cans first. Do you remember saying that you didn't know that, right? Um, are you talking about on cross? I'm talking about throughout these whole proceedings, ma'am. I remember on cross, I couldn't remember because the way you were questioning me. Well, ma'am, I'm not asking you about whether or not you remember anything on cross. I'm asking you whether or not previous to that, you told us that you couldn't remember if you put the gas, gasoline into the car first or into the cans first. Yes, I do remember that. OK. But yet, when the jurors asked you the question, do you remember that you said, oh, I put the, the gas into the car first, and then I must have tripped or turned off the meter, if you will, and that's why there's these separate transactions. Do you remember telling us that? That was my only logic and understanding. And well, I I'm not asking that. about your logic and understanding. Isn't that what you told the jury just previously today? I did say that, but not in response to the question you're referring to. Ma'am, whether it's in response to the question I'm posing to you or not, isn't it true that that's what you told people, uh, the jurors here? Yes. So, so my question to you then, ma'am, is, isn't it true then that you do remember the sequence of events involving the filling up the car with gas in Pasadena? Objection. This character has her testimony as to what she was filling up. The only part I remember as far as sequence is I put the gas in the gas cans and then so I didn't leave the hose laying on the floor or the ground or the concrete, I hung it up. That ends the transaction. That's all I know. So you're saying now you're back to the, the issue of telling us that you don't remember whether or not you put gas in the car first or in the gas cans first, right? That's what you're saying. I really don't know the exact sequence. I wouldn't bet all my money on what it was. I can only go by receipts and times to help me remember. But that's so, you, so that's what you're saying, though, that you don't remember now. That's what you're telling us, right? From memory, no. That's what I'm asking you for. What, what is your memory of that event, right? Right? That's what I'm asking you, right? Okay. And with regard to that time, nobody was yelling at you at that time, right? That's correct. Nobody was grilling you, right? That's correct. You've been fond of telling us how great of a memory you have if no one is yelling at you, right? Yes. 
but that's something that you just don't remember, though, right? Uh, not in great detail, that's right. But, but you did tell us that you do have a very good memory for detail previously, though, right? Usually, yes. Uh, Ma'am, the other thing that you told us with regard to these gas cans is that you purchased one in Salinas, California, right? Yes. Five-gallon gas can, right? Yes. And you purchased this uh, gas can in Salinas, and you said after a short period of time, you, well, you didn't say a period of time, but you said that you returned it back to the store, in, in the Walmart in Salinas, right? That's correct. And it's the same store that you brought it from, right? Yes. Because it was in the, probably because it was in the same general vicinity, right? Right. And ma'am, one of the other things that you said was that it, the reason that you did this was because you, it was expensive and it didn't seem to make sense to you to get that gas can, right? Yeah, in hindsight, I realized it didn't make sense. All right. So why is it then, are you, why is it then, ma'am, that you showed up with three gas cans in Salt Lake City. Objection mischaracterizing the testimony. Overruled. You're not the scope of the questions as well. Approach, please. So why is it that you had uh, three gas cans in Salt Lake City, ma'am? I don't even recall going to Salt Lake City. I went to West Jordan. And I went so you, to... Oh, hold on. You, you, you're, first, let's break that down. You're saying you don't ever even remember going to Salt Lake City, ever, on June 6th of 2008. I don't recall where the city limits end and begin, but to answer the gas can question, I went to Mesa with two gas cans. Well, you did go to Salt Lake City, right? I was in the vicinity. I went to Sandy, I think, and West Jordan. You did visit an individual by the name of Brian Burns, right? That's correct. And during that time, before you left Salt Lake City, you left Salt Lake City area in the very early morning hours, right? Yes. You filled up with gas, right? I think I did. I don't know. Well, let's look. Let's start looking at this. And in fact, ma'am, we'll take a look at exhibit 237.017. You see L SLC? Yes. You don't have any doubt that that stands for Salt Lake City, Utah, does it? No, I don't doubt that. And that's Tesoro, right? That's yes. a gas station, right? Yes. And you fill, you put some gasoline there, right? Yes. We look down here, it does have your name on there, right? Yes. Then if we look at exhibit 237.016, Salt Lake City, right? Yes. And does you see your name right there? Yes. So you were in Salt Lake City, first of all, to establish that, right? OK, yes. And you were there in the early morning hours, right? He, I left Ryan's house in the early morning hours, so. Well, that's so we can just make sure that we have the time, 237.016. See the time there? Yes. What time does it indicate that you're putting gas in the car, right? Yes, 3.57. Right, and it does tell us here that you went to pump number two, right? Yes. Put in 10.672 gallons, right? Yes. 
And the price for each one was three eighty-five dollars per gallon, right? Yes. And it was $41.18, right? Yes. Then at two, exhibit 237.017, same gas station. You see that? Yes. You see the date and the approval time? Yes. It's 4.05 in the morning, correct? Correct. And on this one, it's $36.98, right? Yes. And it talks about that you're at pump two again, and it's 9.583 gallons, right? That's correct. You actually put in more gas, though, didn't you? I don't know. Well, then let's take a look at the... You had a bank account with Washington Mutual, didn't you? Yes, I did. And in fact, we have some receipts here that talk about you having an account with Washington Mutual. And in fact, you had two of them, right? Yes, a business and a personal. 237.005, you see that? Yes. There's an account, there's a deposit, that's your account, right? I'm going to reject this beyond the scope of the questions. Overruled. Right? That's my account. And then you also had another account, 237.006, and we've talked about this exhibit, right, before? Um, yeah, I think so. Washington Mutual account, right? Yes. And there are records that Washington Mutual keeps, don't they? Yes. You of that? Yes. And there are statements that they send out to you, don't they? Um, I think I got them online, usually. But there are statements that are prepared, whether they are yes. online or they're sent out, right? That's correct. Go ahead and take a look at an exhibit. Take a look at exhibit number 523, and I think you've looked at it. See if that refreshes your, or whether or not you recognize that as your statement from Washington Mutual. Um, yes, it does look like that. And what's the time period, ma'am? Should say on the upper right-hand corner. It says June 1st through June 30th. All right. I may have it back. for the admission of Exhibit 
523 is admitted. Take a look at exhibit 523. That's your parents' home, correct? No, that's my grandparents' home. That's your grandparents' home. And that's where you were living, right? Yes. On page two, there are three transactions that I want to focus into Tesoro. And Tesoro is the, on 237.016, that's the merchant. You see that? Yes. 237.017, that's also Tesoro. Do you see that? 237, what did you say? Tesoro. Where? Do you see that at the very top? Oh, yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. And so when we're talking about this exhibit, do you see three transactions to Tesoro in Salt Lake City, Utah, correct? Yes, I do. You were in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 6th of 2008, weren't you? Yes. You just told me that you were leaving there in the morning, that area, to come back to Wairika, right? That's correct. You told us previously that you were going to come back so that you could go back to work, right? Yes. And if you take a look at this purchase here from Tesoro, you see the amount there? Yes. How much is that, ma'am? $36.98. Okay. Let's take a look at exhibit number 237.017. How much is the amount? $36.98. It's the same station, it's the same amount, correct? Correct. That's the same purchase, right? Yes. And exhibit number 237.016, it's, it's for how much, ma'am? 41.18. And if we go down here, you see that right there? Yes. How much is that? 41.18. That's the same amount, right? Correct. And then you do have, though, a third transaction there. Do you see that? Yes. 1965, right? Yes. Ma'am, if we go back to exhibit number 237.017, how much was the price per gallon that you bought that day? Um, it looks like 3.85. And 9 tenths, right? Yes. Ma'am, if you take this amount per gallon, 3859, 3.859, $3.859 cents per gallon, and you divide it into this amount of 1965. Do you know how much, how, what, what, what that division would indicate? No. Would it be, surprise you that it would indicate that it's 5.09? Would that surprise you? Um, no. So, you make three purchases here, don't you? Yes. You also, there are two purchases for sure that we know that are for gas, right? That's correct. The other one is for 1965, right? Yes. If we do the mathematics, that equals five gallons of gas. Objection. If you if you were putting gas. Objection, argumentative is uh, there's no testimony that it was gas purchased. Overruled. What was your question? The, the question is a mathematical one, ma'am. Isn't it true that if you divide 1965 by 3.859 that you would get 5.09. If the math is correct, then yes. And you did indicate to us that you did buy a third can in Salinas, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you bought that in Salinas, and it was a five-gallon gas can, right? That's correct. Ma'am, would it surprise you that the Walmart in Salinas does not have any record of any refund Objection. back on June 2nd when you claim you bought this, or June 3rd when you claim you bought this, Objection. of a refund? Objection. beyond the scope. Approach, please.
may continue. Yeah. Exhibit number 237.008, Walmart receipt. You see this, correct? Yes. This is the Walmart that you went to in Salinas and you purchased a five gallon gas can, right? You told us that before, right? Yes, I did. And you were there on June 3rd of 2008 at 322 in the afternoon when you made that purchase, right? That's correct. Would it surprise you to find that on that, per and you said that you got a refund in cash, didn't you? Yes, I did. Would it surprise you that Walmart does not have any record of any refund for a gas can on that date of June 3rd of 2008? Considering that I returned it, that would surprise me. Pardon? Considering that I returned it, that would surprise me. It would surprise you? Yes. Because you claim you returned it on that day, right? Yes, I did, and I received cash for it. Pardon? And I received and cash for it. And you received cash. Okay. Okay. You also told us that you received an injury to your right finger at Casa Ramos. Do you remember that? Approach, please. May continue. Do you remember in response to a question from the jurors that you said that you damaged your right finger during a glass breaking incident at Casa Ramos? Do you remember telling us that? It was not glass breaking, I jammed it on a metal ledge. All right. At so Casa at Ramos. Casa Ramos, you injured your finger, right? Yes. And do you remember that you told us, well, no paperwork was filled out, right? That's correct. And you told us that no paperwork was filled out was because this was a really small business, right? Um, I said it was a, did I say small business? It's just private business, yeah. Well, no, pri most businesses are private. Are, are you saying now that, that you meant to, to say it was a private business? Is that what you're saying? No, it was a small business. There were only like maybe four or five restaurants. So you, you think that four or five restaurants are a small business, right? Usually I work for chains that have thousands of restaurants, so that's a very small business, yes. So to you, this is a small business because you believe that there are only four, re four, bis four locations, right? There may have even been less then. I don't know. I think and, there were very few in the Northern California area. And just because they're a small business, they do not have to comply with reporting accidents on the job, is what you're telling us, right? Yes, you call speculation relevancy. Sustain to that question. Ma'am, actually, don't they actually have, back then, didn't they actually have 13 restaurants? Objection, cost of speculation, ask and answer. Oh, really? Um, not that particular franchise. They only had a few. I know that I, my understanding is that it's a family of two brothers or cousins. They are related somehow. And that they own a chain of a different type of restaurant in Oregon. And then the restaurants I worked for, there was just a few of them. So you're saying that the... There may be two restaurants then that are called Casa Rome, right? No, not two. There were more than two, but there weren't very many. No, what you're saying is that that, that there's that you're drawing now a distinction between the ownership of the Casa Ramos restaurants, one being owned by one member of the family and one being owned by another member of the family, right? Objection relevance argument is way beyond the scope of any of the questions. The other restaurants are called Azteca, so yeah, they're completely different. All right, so when we talk about Casa Ramos, we're actually just talking about on the marquee Casa Ramos, and your, your belief is there's only approximately four of those, right? I only knew of four or five. And because of their size, you told us, or you, in response to a jury question, that even though you suffered this injury, well, you did tell the manager about the injury, didn't you? I had to get a Band-Aid, yes. Well, you did tell the manager about the injury. Didn't you tell us that? Yes. And you did take a picture of that injury, right? Yes. And we've seen that picture of that injury, right? Yes. And you're saying that because of the type of business that it was, no claim had to be filed pursuant to the laws of, of the state of California, right? 
That's not what I'm saying. I said that that was my speculation as to why nothing was ever filled out. You didn't fill anything out, right? No, I didn't. The manager didn't fill anything out, even though you told him about it, right? Did you actually cause speculation? Sustained. You, you did talk to the manager about it, correct? Not in great depth. I asked him for a band-aid. I'm not asking you in great depth. Yes or no, did you talk to the manager? I asked him for a band-aid. So are you now saying that you didn't tell the manager that you hurt yourself on the job? Is that what you're now telling us? I'm not sure what was said. I just know I needed a band-aid quick because it was busy and I was about to bleed a lot. So it appears from what you're telling us now is that you never indicated to him that you were injured on the job then, as you previously told us. Well, asking for a band-aid is an indication that I'm injured. Pardon? Asking for a band-aid to me is an indication that I've, I'm injured. No, but what I'm saying is specifically, previously on your examination, you indicated that you did talk to the manager about your injury. Do you remember telling us that? Yes. And during that conversation, you said that he knew that you had injured yourself at work. Do you remember telling us that? I don't know what he knew. I just know that he knew I asked him for a band-aid. So, so now you never told him about you being injured on the job. You just for, asked for a band-aid then, right? Yes, and I was holding my hand, putting pressure on it. And you were holding your hand, putting pressure on it. And you're saying he didn't ask you anything about how you injured your hand at all, right? Objection calls for hearsay. I only remember that we were very busy in the middle of the rush, and we didn't have time to sit and discuss my hand. I, I'm not asking you if you were busy. I'm asking you whether or not. Isn't it true that he did not ask you, according to your statement, anything about how you'd, you'd suffered that injury? That, according to my statement, what you're saying is not true, or it might be true, but I don't remember what was discussed regarding the injury. All I know is I hurt my hand, it, the skin folded back, I flipped it over, put pressure on it, and said I, need, I went and found my manager, said I need a Band-Aid right away. There were tons of tickets coming through, I had a bazillion margaritas to make, and it was busy, and I needed a Band-Aid. That's all I know. Okay. So you did not cut yourself on a margarita glass, though, right? No, I didn't cut myself on glass. It was a jam from right. metal. No, previously, do you remember telling us in response to a jury question that you had cut yourself on a margarita glass? glass. Testimony. Overruled. To me, answer. I didn't say margarita glass. In reference to Casa Ramos, I cut my hand on a glass at Travis's house. I'm talking about Casa Ramos. I'm not talking about Mr. Alexander's house. I'm talking about Casa Ramos. You're saying that you injured your finger, your right ring finger, on something other than glass, correct? Yes. And you didn't tell the manager about the way this occurred, even though it occurred while on the job, right? I don't recall if it was discussed in detail or not. And you're the same person that previously testified today that you have a very good memory for details, right? Yes. Except for then. You don't remember that one, right? I didn't say it was perfect. I said it was good. No, I'm not saying that you said it was perfect. You, you yourself admitted that you had a good memory for details, right? Objection, argumentative estimate. Overruled. I don't even know that I used details. I just said I think I have a good memory. Judge, I'm done with this area. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, no court tomorrow, Friday. No court Monday or Tuesday, the 11th and 12th. So we'll see you back here on the 13th at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on the 13th. Between now and then, remember the admonition. Are there any questions? We'll see you next Wednesday. You are excused. Sarah, she may step down. Thank you. Council, anything else? No. We are at recess.